okay? Uh, so for the fluctuations in tightness, the fluctuation in theta, and of course because they drive directly the fluctuation in unemployment rate and the fluctuation in vacancy rate, they are going to be uh, much much smaller. They are much smaller than uh, in US data. Okay, so it means that your model, uh, the model is not really adapted to think about business cycle because when you put productivity shots, which are the only shots that can give you counter-cyclical unemployment as well as a beverage curve, you get really tiny fluctuations in unemployment. So it means that you're never able to explain like, you know, how unemployment gets up to 10% in bad recession, like in the Great Recession, and 3% in really great booms. You really cannot explain that. Here you would have fluctuations in tightness, you know, that are uh, about 10 times too small. So your fluctuations in unemployment are going to be 10 times too small, okay? An order of magnitude too small. So this tells you that the model with surplus sharing as a wedge function is inappropriate uh, to describe business cycles on the labor market. So this violates the first kind of um, criterion that Kuhn put forward as a good model. You know, the criterion one in Kuhn is that the model has to be descriptive. It has to be able to describe well what we see in the reality. And here it doesn't do that because uh, it gets fluctuations that are much, much smaller. Uh, your fluctuations are much smaller than what we see uh, in the data. Okay, so, uh, oops. So this violates you know, the criterion one. Number one for a good model. According to, of course, uh, our friend Thomas Kuhn. Okay. Um, and so, actually, if you read the literature, what a lot of people took away from the Shiner paper, from this result, is that, uh, so something here that, of course, key, and I'm going to highlight, is that this is when we use a matching model with surplus sharing. Well, a lot of people, because surplus sharing or Nash bargaining were uh, such classical assumptions, and because they've always been used in the literature, a lot of people, what they took away from the Shiner analysis, that uh, we should throw away the matching model in the trash can. That the matching model was not helpful to think about business cycle, that it wasn't helpful to describe unemployment, because it wasn't able to generate fluctuations that were large enough. But of course, this result is contingent on the assumption that wages are determined by surplus sharing. But there is no reason that that's the case. As uh, we discussed, any, you can assume any wedge function and your model is no more or no less legitimate. Then the question is, have you made a good assumption? And whether your assumption is good or not, you have to look at how the real world uh, works. And, uh, and you have to try to describe the real world as well as possible and then see what are the implications. And in the real world, it's true that there is some bargaining, but it's not super prevalent. And there are a lot of other factors that affect wages. As we said, there are regulations that limit how much wage can move, such as the minimum wage, which puts a lower bound on wages. And there are institutions that limit how much wages can move, such as unions. And also kind of internal pay, uh, pay scales that firms adopt that rigidify wages at different levels of the firm. Uh, there are also managerial considerations that will uh, lead firms not to change their wage too much, not to reduce their wage too much in bad times. And you know, actually, if you're interested in this managerial consideration, um, the book by Truman Bewley, published 
I think in 1999, why wages don't fall in uh, why wages don't fall in recession. It's a book I gave you the reference for the book. Something that if you're interested in, in that question, you should look at. Truman Dury went and interviewed managers in U.S. firms to try to understand why wages were not moving more, especially when unemployment was so high. How come firms don't take advantage of high unemployment to cut wages? And the reason is that if you're a firm and you cut wages, that's going to have a very detrimental effect on the morale of your workers and therefore on productivity, following a little bit the logic of the efficiency wage theory. So a lot of firms report not changing their wage too much and especially not cutting their wage in bad times because they are afraid of um, upsetting their workers. So we see that for this managerial reason, wages are not going to move very much. In particular, they are never going to move as much as what's predicted by uh, an, an assumption such as surplus sharing or in fact other bargaining assumption. So overall, the problem is not with the matching model, but it was with the assumption of surplus sharing. Once you strip that assumption away and you replace it, say, with a rigid wage, like what we've done earlier, and you know you calibrate the amount of rigidity to try to match what you see in micro um, data or in whatever data you have on wages, then you get a model that behaves very respectably and that gives you enough fluctuations in unemployment. Um, so instead of throwing away the matching model, the only thing that had to be done was to throw away the surplus sharing assumption. Uh, and then once you replace it with something more appropriate, you get a, a model that behaves um, very well over the business cycle.